If we want to understand the origins of thermodynamic concepts such as entropy and free energy, we have to go back to the time of the Industrial Revolution. During this time, society drastically changed thanks to the introduction of the steam engine. We could manufacture more and we could transport more using the steam train. The great impact of the steam engine inspired engineers and scientists to study the working principles of heat engines in more detail. In 1824, Sadi Carnot wrote his book Reflections on the Motive Power of Fire. As the title says, the central topic is how heat can be used to perform useful work. In particular, he asked the question, can we make the steam engine more efficient? Or more generally, how efficient can a heat engine theoretically be? Carnot proposed an engine which has the highest efficiency that is theoretically possible. A few decades later, in 1850, Rudolf Clausius analyzed Carnot's engine mathematically. This mathematical analysis led to the idea of entropy. Entropy is a concept that nowadays still plays a very important role in thermodynamics and physics in general. So in summary, we started with a very practical question. How can we make better engines? The answer to this question led to very important fundamental insights in thermodynamics. In particular, it led to the concept of entropy. It has even been said, one way or another, that the steam engine did more for science than science did for the steam engine. This may be an exaggeration, but nevertheless, these statements do emphasize that the practical applications of the steam engine led to very important fundamental physical insights. With that in mind, let us first understand how a steam engine works. Fundamentally, you have a gas or vapor which continuously expands and gets compressed. This cyclical expansion and compression generates mechanical motion, which can be used to power machines. But there's a problem with this operating principle. The expansion of the vapor generates work, but an equal amount of work is needed to compress the vapor. If expansion generates the same amount of work that is necessary for compression, then no network is done, and the engine is useless. To solve this issue, we introduce heat. We can introduce two reservoirs, one hot reservoir, one cold reservoir. We connect the vapor to the hot reservoir to heat it up, and let the vapor expand. Then we connect the vapor to the cold reservoir to cool it down, and let the vapor be compressed. So effectively, heat flows from the hot reservoir to the cold reservoir via the vapor. The vapor can be compressed more easily at low temperatures. So the work that is generated by expansion is more than the work that is needed to compress the vapor. Therefore, a net positive amount of work is done thanks to the flow of heat. Now let's reduce the working principle of the engine to its bare fundamentals. We saw that thanks to the flow of heat from hot to cold, we were able to produce useful work. We can represent this abstractly as a heat engine. We can draw the hot and cold reservoirs and the heat that flows between them. This flow of heat generates useful work. The simplified schematic illustrates the general working principle of a heat engine. Sadi Carnot then asked himself the following question. What is the maximum possible efficiency of such a general heat engine? To answer this question, he imagined the heat engine as a water wheel. Just like the flow of heat from high temperature to low temperature can generate work, the flow of water from high to low can be used to make a water wheel move. We then claim that the most efficient water wheel is one that is reversible. That is, we can use the same water wheel in reverse to scoop up water from low to high. If we power this reverse wheel with the first wheel, then the same amount of water that falls down to power the first wheel is scooped up again by the second wheel. So if we combine the two wheels, there is zero net effect. Effectively, no water has flowed between the reservoirs and no useful work has been generated. So why would this reversible water wheel be the most efficient? Let's suppose the opposite is true, namely that there is a water wheel that is not reversible, which is more efficient than the reversible wheel. If we use this efficient wheel to power the reversed wheel, then we can scoop up more water for the same amount of water falling down. 
so the net effect of these two water wheels is that water is flowing from low to high. So if there were an irreversible wheel that is more efficient than the reversible wheel, we could make water flow spontaneously from low to high. Note that the keyword here is spontaneously. Of course there's nothing special about making water flow from low to high. We can achieve this with an ordinary water pump. But the point is that such a water pump has to be powered externally. We typically pay little attention to what is necessary to generate that power. But in this case, we take into account the effects of both the pump and its power source. And we find that the total combined effect is that water flows from low to high. So if we make the natural assumption that water can only spontaneously flow from high to low, then we must conclude that there can be no water wheel more efficient than the reversible water wheel, because if there were, our assumption would be violated. Using what we now know about the water wheel, we can now interpret the falling water as flowing heat, and we can interpret a height difference as a temperature difference. The same reasoning that we apply to the water wheel, we can now use to analyze the heat engine. Consider a heat engine, which uses a heat flow to perform work. Now operate that heat engine in reverse. It uses work to make heat flow from cold to hot. That is, it works as a refrigerator. If there is a heat engine more efficient than a reversible heat engine, then the net effect of the combined heat engine and the refrigerator is that heat spontaneously flows from cold to hot. However, what we observe in nature is that heat only spontaneously flows from hot to cold, not the other way around. If we make this fundamental assumption, which is a precursor to the second law of thermodynamics, then we must conclude that the most efficient heat engine is the one that is reversible. We now know that the most efficient heat engine is one that is reversible. So the next question is, how do we construct a reversible heat engine? To answer that question, let's look at which processes are irreversible and which processes are reversible. Suppose we have a hot gas or vapor. Now we connect it to the cold reservoir so that the gas cools down and gets compressed. This process is irreversible because if we run the animation in reverse, it doesn't make sense. If the gas is connected to the cold reservoir, we cannot heat up the gas by pulling back the piston. Therefore, cooling the gas by connecting it to the cold reservoir is an irreversible process. Similarly, heating and expanding a cold gas by connecting it to a hot reservoir is an irreversible process, because you cannot cool a gas while it's connected to a hot reservoir by compressing the gas. Now let's look at some processes that are reversible. Suppose we connect a hot gas to the hot reservoir. If we slowly move the piston back or forth, then the gas remains at the temperature of the reservoir. The animation makes sense if we play it either forward or backward, so the process is reversible. So we conclude that compression and expansion at a fixed temperature while connected to a reservoir is a reversible process. We can also look at what happens to a system that is not connected to any reservoir, so no heat can flow into or out of the system. If we have a hot gas and then pull the piston backwards, then the gas cools down due to the expansion. If we push the piston forward, the gas heats up again. So the animation makes sense when we run it either forwards or backwards, so the process is reversible. Carnot concluded that the most efficient heat engine is one that is reversible. So let's come up with a cycle that consists of only reversible processes. Keep in mind that in order to have the engine perform useful work, the gas must expand at a high temperature and be compressed at a low temperature. So let's start by expanding the gas at a high temperature. We saw that if we keep the temperature constant by connecting the gas to a hot reservoir and by moving the piston slowly, the process is reversible. Expanding the gas at a constant temperature is also called isothermal expansion. After expanding the gas at a high temperature, we need to cool it down to a low temperature in a reversible manner. We saw previously that we can cool the gas in a reversible manner by moving the piston back while preventing any heat flow between the gas and the surrounding. 
This process is called adiabatic expansion. Now that the gas is at a low temperature, we can compress it in a reversible manner by connecting the gas to a cold reservoir, so that its temperature is kept constant. This reversible process is called isothermal compression. To complete the cycle, we need to heat up the gas again in a reversible manner, which can be done by adiabatic compression. We now created a cycle which produces useful work because the gas expands at a high temperature and gets compressed at a low temperature. And this cycle is reversible, so it has maximum efficiency. This engine is called the Carnot engine. Now that we understand on an intuitive level the concept of the Carnot engine, the next step is to analyze it mathematically. To describe the processes of the Carnot cycle mathematically, we start with the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law describes the relation between the volume, pressure and temperature of an ideal gas. It states that the pressure times the volume is proportional to the temperature. Let's look at a few examples to convince ourselves that this law makes sense intuitively. Suppose we fix the position of the piston, so that the gas cannot expand. This means the volume V is fixed. If we now heat up the gas, so that the temperature T becomes larger, then the pressure P must become larger as well to keep the equality valid. This makes sense intuitively. If we heat up a gas or vapor within a container of a fixed volume, then the pressure in the container increases. Now suppose we allow the piston to move freely, so the volume V can change. The piston is kept in place by the balance between the pressure P of the gas and the fixed atmospheric pressure. Therefore, in this case the volume V can vary, while the gas pressure P is constant. So if we now increase the temperature T of the gas, the volume V must increase as well. This also makes sense intuitively. Heating up a gas causes it to expand. The full ideal gas law reads PV equals nRT. Here, n is related to the amount of gas molecules, and R is a fixed value which is called the gas constant. With the help of the ideal gas law, let's now analyze the Carnot cycle mathematically. This analysis was first performed by Rudolf Clausius in 1850. Clausius starts his analysis by challenging a fundamental assumption made by Carnot. Carnot compared the heat engine to a water wheel, and he believed that heat is a fluid, just like water. He believed that heat is conserved in the process of running the engine. In the case of the water wheel, it is the flow of water that makes the wheel turn, but the water itself is not created or destroyed. Similarly, Carnot believed that the flow of heat makes a heat engine work, but the heat itself is not created or destroyed. Clausius contested this belief of Carnot, and instead proposed that heat is a form of energy, which can be converted to other sorts of energy. For example, friction can convert mechanical energy to heat. So why should it not be possible to convert heat to mechanical energy? So Clausius proposed that not just the flow of heat generates work in a heat engine, but heat itself is converted to work. This statement is quantified in what is now known as the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics is basically a statement of conservation of energy, where it is recognized that there are different forms of energy which can be converted into each other. The first form of energy is the internal energy U of a gas. It refers to the energy contained by the gas itself, which is closely related to its temperature. A gas with high temperature has lots of internal energy, and a gas with low temperature has little internal energy. Q is the heat energy that enters the system. So if Q is positive, it means heat enters the gas. According to this equation, this increases the internal energy of the gas, which means its temperature increases. And indeed, we intuitively expect that if you put heat in a gas, its temperature increases. The third form of energy is the mechanical energy W that is performed by the gas. So if the gas expands, then it performs work, so W is positive. According to this equation, the internal energy of the gas decreases, so its temperature decreases. 
This is indeed what we saw for adiabatic expansion. By expanding the gas, the gas cools down. Furthermore, we can find an expression for the work W done by the gas. If the piston moves by a distance s, then we can write the work as force times distance. The force is equal to the pressure P of the gas times the area A of the piston. The area A times the distance s is equal to the change in volume V of the gas. Therefore, the work W equals P delta V. We can now calculate the work that is performed by the Carnot cycle. If the volume changes by delta V, then the work is given by P times delta V. So if V changes continuously, then the work is given by the integral of P times dV. Therefore, if we plot the pressure of the gas as function of the volume of the gas, then the work is given by the area under the curve. So let's plot the Carnot cycle in a PV diagram. At the start of the cycle, the gas has some pressure P1 and volume V1. The first step of the Carnot cycle is isothermal expansion at a high temperature Th. The gas expands, which means the volume V becomes larger. From the ideal gas law, we know that then the pressure must decrease. We end up at the second point in the PV diagram. The next step of the Carnot cycle is adiabatic expansion. During this step, the volume V becomes larger, while the temperature decreases. Then we perform isothermal compression at a fixed low temperature Tc. During the compression, the volume V decreases, and from the ideal gas law it follows that the pressure increases. The final step, which completes the Carnot cycle, is adiabatic compression which returns the gas to its original volume, pressure and temperature. We can visualize each point in the PV diagram using the picture of the two reservoirs and the piston. Along the top curve, heat flows from the hot reservoir to the gas. Along the second curve, there is no heat flow. Along the bottom curve, heat flows from the gas to the cold reservoir. Along the fourth curve, there is again no heat flow. The cycle continues along the loop in the PV diagram and the work that is performed each cycle is equal to the surface area enclosed by the loop. Let's calculate for each curve separately how much work is performed. The work is given by the integral over P dV. For an isothermal process, the expression for P as a function of V is found using the ideal gas law. The resulting integral can be calculated straightforwardly. The same calculation can be performed for both isothermal processes. Now we need to analyze the adiabatic processes. Adiabatic processes are less straightforward to understand than isothermal processes, so let's go into a bit more detail. In an adiabatic process, there is by definition no heat flow. Together with the first law of thermodynamics, we conclude that the change in the internal energy of the gas is given by the work performed by the gas. We can rewrite this further by using the ideal gas law. A change in temperature causes a change in the product PV, which can be expanded using the product rule. We can rewrite the change in temperature in terms of the change in internal energy. We use the first law of thermodynamics to rewrite delta U. We move the term P delta V to the other side of the equation. We assume that the internal energy of the gas is directly proportional to its temperature, so delta U divided by delta T is a fixed constant. This constant is called the heat capacity of the gas. It tells you how much heat you have to put into the gas in order to raise its temperature by one degree, assuming that all the heat energy you put in goes to raising the temperature of the gas not to increasing the volume of the gas. Therefore, this constant is denoted as Cv, which indicates that it's the heat capacity for a gas at a fixed volume. So we can simplify the expression by using Cv. Furthermore, we can write the expression even more compactly by defining the constant gamma. If we make the differences delta p and delta v infinitesimally small, we obtain a separable integral equation. We rewrite this equation so that all the p's are on one side 
and the v's on the other side. Taking the integral on both sides yields two natural logarithms and an integration constant c. We take the natural exponent on both sides and then take v to the power minus gamma to the left side. This yields the equation for an adiabatic process. p times v to the power gamma remains constant during the process. We can use the ideal gas law to rewrite p. This leads us to the conclusion that during an adiabatic process, t times v to the power gamma minus 1 remains constant. With these two results, let's go back to analyzing the Carnot cycle. The work performed by the gas is given by the integral over p dv, and we can use the relation found for adiabatic processes to write p as a function of v. The resulting integral can be computed straightforwardly. The same procedure can be performed for both adiabatic processes. We can simplify the final expressions by writing them in terms of temperature. We find our final expression by substituting the definition of gamma. Now that we have calculated the work that is produced by the Carnot cycle, we now look at the heat that flows through the engine. For this, we turn to the first law of thermodynamics. The internal energy is proportional to the temperature of the gas. So in an isothermal process, where by definition the temperature is constant, the internal energy must be constant as well. Therefore, delta U is zero, and from the first law of thermodynamics, the work that is performed by the gas must equal the heat that is put into the gas. So the work that is performed by the gas during isothermal expansion is equal to the amount of heat that flows into the gas. The work that is performed on the gas is equal to the amount of heat that flows out of the gas. The minus sign signifies that heat flows out of the gas. We have now found the heat flow during isothermal expansion and compression. During the adiabatic processes, by definition no heat flow takes place, but we can still analyze them to simplify the result that we found for the isothermal processes. We can use the expression we found for adiabatic processes to relate the volumes of the gas to the temperatures. By dividing the two equations by each other, we find a relation between the ratios of volumes at high temperature and low temperature. If we plug this into the result we found for the isothermal processes, we find that the input heat divided by the high temperature is equal to the output heat divided by the low temperature. This is an important result that we can use to calculate the optimal efficiency of a heat engine. In a heat engine, a certain amount of heat flows in and a certain amount of heat flows out. The difference is converted to work. The efficiency of a heat engine is given by the work that is produced divided by the heat that you need to put in. We can write the work as the difference between the input heat and output heat. We then find that the efficiency depends on the ratio between the input heat and output heat. For the Carnot engine specifically, we find that the efficiency depends on the ratio between the temperatures of the two reservoirs. This efficiency is the theoretical maximum for a heat engine. So we found that for a fully reversible heat engine, the sum of input heat and output heat divided by the respective temperatures equals zero. What happens if the engine is not reversible? Let's consider the least efficient, most irreversible engine. In this case, heat simply flows from the hot reservoir to the cold reservoir without producing any work that could later be used to reverse the flow of heat. The input heat is equal to the output heat, and the work is zero. We now see that the sum of the heat flows divided by the temperatures is less than zero, because Q in is positive Q out is negative, and Q out is divided by the lower temperature. The general rule is formulated by Clausius inequality. It states that the sum of all heat flows divided by the temperatures is less than or equal to zero. Equality holds when the engine is fully reversible. So we see that heat flow divided by temperature is an important quantity related to the reversibility of processes. Let us suppose that an object with a certain temperature T also has a certain property that we denote with the letter S. The definition of S is such that if some amount of heat Q flows in, then S increases by Q over T. 
Let's see how the quantity S relates to the reversibility of processes. If a hot object and a cold object touch each other, then heat will spontaneously flow from hot to cold. The reverse will never happen spontaneously, so this is considered an irreversible process. The change in S for the hot object is negative, because heat leaves the object. It is small because the temperature is high. The change in S for the cold object is positive, because heat enters the object. It is large because the temperature is low. Adding these two contributions together gives the total change in S, which is positive because the positive contribution is larger than the negative contribution. Heat keeps flowing and S keeps increasing until both objects reach a common equilibrium temperature. So the initial state has low S, while the final state has maximum S. Therefore, we can conclude that S quantifies the degree to which the system has irreversibly transformed. Clausius, in 1865, interpreted S as the transformational content of the body. He named S the entropy, after the Greek word for transformation and to make it sound similar to energy. Clausius concluded that if we would calculate the entropy and energy of the entire universe, we would find that the total energy remains constant, while the total entropy increases. These two laws are today known as the first and second laws of thermodynamics. So according to the second law of thermodynamics, entropy increases, and the change in entropy is defined as the heat flow divided by the temperature. We also know that according to Clausius' inequality, the sum of heat flows divided by their temperatures over a cycle is equal to or less than zero. At first sight, this seems like a contradiction. The total change in entropy always increases, but the integral of Clausius' inequality is always less than zero. Why is this the case? The reason is that in Clausius' inequality, we don't look at the entropy change of the reservoirs, but we only look at the engine in between them. Moreover, we don't look at the entropy change of the engine because we divide by the temperature of the surrounding reservoirs, not the engine itself. Therefore, the second law of thermodynamics and Clausius' inequality don't contradict each other, even though they may appear to do so at first sight. So by introducing the concept of entropy, we have quantified the degree to which a system has irreversibly transformed. But is there any practical reason for doing so? The reason why introducing entropy is useful is because it can be used to predict whether certain processes will occur spontaneously or not. The second law states that for spontaneous processes, the total entropy must always increase. Suppose we have an object with entropy S and temperature T in an environment with some other surrounding temperature. If some heat Q flows from the surrounding into the object, the entropy of the surrounding decreases by Q divided by the surrounding temperature. At the same time, the entropy of the object increases by some amount delta S. This amount is due to the heat flow into the object, but also due to whatever other changes take place inside the object, such as chemical reactions. The condition for such a process to occur is that the total change in entropy must be greater than zero. The total entropy change is given by the entropy change of the object plus the entropy change of the surrounding. In other words, the object must gain more entropy than the surrounding loses. Now that we know the general condition for a process to occur spontaneously, we can look at different specific types of systems and formulate the conditions for spontaneity for them. We will derive these conditions by using the first and second law of thermodynamics. The first law says that energy can be converted from one type to another, but that the total amount of energy is always conserved. The second law says that the total amount of entropy must always increase. The first system we consider is a fully closed and isolated system. No heat can flow in or out of the system, and it cannot expand or contract. From the first law it then follows that the internal energy cannot change. From the second law it follows that the change in entropy of the system must always be larger than zero. These are the same rules that Clausius stated for the entire universe. Energy is conserved and entropy increases. For a more interesting case, 
Let's consider a closed container where heat can flow in or out. It's a sturdy container, so its volume cannot change. But because it allows for heat flow, the temperature of the system will be kept the same as the temperature of the surrounding. From the first law it follows that the change in internal energy is the same as the heat that flows into the system. From the second law it follows that the change in entropy of the system must be larger than its change in internal energy divided by its temperature, which is the same as the surrounding temperature. We can rewrite this as a condition that delta U minus T delta S must be less than zero. This expression motivates the introduction of a new quantity, which is called the Helmholtz free energy. Just like a ball rolling down a hill seeks to minimize its potential energy, a system in a closed container with a fixed volume and temperature seeks to minimize its Helmholtz free energy. We can see that at low temperatures, minimizing the Helmholtz free energy means minimizing its internal energy. At high temperatures, minimizing the Helmholtz free energy means maximizing its entropy. Therefore, the temperature determines whether internal energy or entropy plays the more important role in a process. This explains why certain processes can only occur at certain temperatures. For example, water only turns into ice at low temperatures, where its entropy and internal energy are lower. The third system we consider is an open container at a fixed temperature. Because the system is open, it is free to expand or be compressed under the surrounding pressure. From the first law, we find that the change in internal energy is due to the heat that flows into the system and the work that is done by the system if it expands or contracts. From the second law, we find the condition for a process to spontaneously occur. We can rewrite this to the condition that delta U plus P delta V minus T delta S must decrease. This motivates the introduction of a new quantity called the Gibbs free energy. The expression U plus PV is also called the enthalpy. Just like a falling object tries to minimize its potential energy, and a closed system tries to minimize its Helmholtz energy, similarly, an open system tries to minimize its Gibbs free energy. Depending on the temperature, either the enthalpy or the entropy drives the process. For higher temperatures, the process is entropy-driven, and for lower temperatures, the process is enthalpy-driven. So we've seen that for a closed container at a fixed temperature, we can define the Helmholtz free energy, and the system spontaneously transforms to a state that minimizes the Helmholtz free energy. For an open container at a fixed temperature and pressure, we can define the Gibbs free energy, and the system spontaneously transforms to a state which minimizes the Gibbs free energy. So let's say we have two substances in an open container, and we want to find out if they will undergo a chemical reaction that produces some other substances. To see if this process will take place spontaneously, we can calculate the Gibbs energy of the first state, and the Gibbs energy of the second state. If there is a decrease in Gibbs energy, then the reaction can take place. Let's summarize all we have seen. We started with the observation that during the Industrial Revolution the steam engine had a major societal impact. This motivated scientists and engineers to study heat engines in general, to optimize the efficiency of engines. Carnot came to the insight that the most efficient heat engine must be the one that is reversible. If there were a heat engine that is more efficient than a reversible heat engine, it would mean that heat could spontaneously flow from cold to hot which is assumed to be impossible. He came to this insight by thinking of the heat engine as a water wheel. Just like the flow of heat drives a heat engine, the flow of water drives a water wheel. Clausius later contested Carnot's claim that it was the flow of heat that drives a heat engine. Instead, he proposed that heat itself is converted to mechanical work. Heat is a form of energy which can be converted to other forms of energy, such as internal energy or work. By mathematically analyzing the Carnot engine, he found that the input heat divided by the input temperature equals the output heat divided by the output temperature. If some input quantity equals some output quantity, it means the quantity is conserved, and conserved quantities play an important role in physics. 
Therefore, Clausius defined a quantity called entropy. It is a measure of irreversibly transformed content. If a process is reversible, such as the Carnot cycle, then entropy is conserved. If a process is irreversible, such as the flow of heat from a hot object to a cold object, then entropy is generated. So entropy gives us a way to quantitatively calculate whether a process can occur spontaneously or not. For different kinds of systems, we can derive different quantities such as the Helmholtz and Gibbs free energy. In a closed and isolated system, entropy increases. In a closed container that is kept at a fixed temperature, the Helmholtz energy decreases. In an open container at a constant pressure and temperature, the Gibbs free energy decreases.